teach at uh, the uh, DePaul University in Chicago, where I'm co-founder of a publishing entity called Big Shoulders Books. Uh, and I'm just, as I said, thrilled to be here. Great. Well, it's wonderful to have you virtually here. And it was particularly wonderful to read what I call a rip snorter. Uh, <laughs> a, a, just a, a lot of fun book. I, of course, I had read, you know, some of the other earlier books of, about King Strang and, you know, read articles in the uh, journals of Beaver Island as well. And, you know, thought I knew him pretty well. But I think what What's marvelous is what what um, Miles Harvey has done is kind of not only bust him open and really explore a lot of his uh, interior life, his pathology, his the way his mind works, but also the historical context. As he said, he he writes you know, uh, historical books. This one reads like fiction. It reads like a Picarex novel. And um, so you're, you know, you're in good company and you, you get to see him as if he's hold, being held up like a crystal and seeing so many different facets, not only about what's inside of him, but like a crystal, it reflects the cultural and political climate of the 1850s. And what's really important, even though he doesn't make any direct, he doesn't hit you over the head with that, it, the, the way that it, that period resonates with what we're going through right now is quite extraordinary. So my first question for you is what what attracted you to this character of, of King Strang in the first place? How did you discover him? Well, the first time I heard about King Strang was maybe, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago. I have a brother-in-law who lives in Burlington, Wisconsin, which is uh, a little town, maybe two hours northwest of Chicago. Um, that was the home of... King Strang's first utopian colony. Before he moved his people up to Beaver Island, he started in what he called Voree, but was is now known as Burlington, Wisconsin. And so I was driving around with my brother-in-law, a fellow by the name of Chris Carr, and uh, he started pointing to old buildings and unspooling this incredible story about this Mormon spin-off group that had started a utopian colony there. And actually in, in uh, Burlington, there are still some of what they call them Strangites left. And so I was just blown away by that story. And, but I didn't do anything with it. And then, I don't know, five or six years ago, my editor um, or my, my agent either called or emailed, probably emailed me and said, you know, a, 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 an editor from a big publishing house in New York, Little Brown, wants to talk to you. And so I said, sure. And I was, Peter, honestly, I was a little skeptical about what could come of that because, you know, what are the chances you're going to like the editor, he's going to like you, and even more so that he's got a project you be interested in. Um, but it turned out like from the start, I, I saw where I could take this story. And, you know, I know people on Beaver, Beaver Island are just really familiar with the Strang story, but uh, I think I added something to it. Um, and so I'll be glad to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, well, you, you certainly have added to it. I mean, I it, it's so interesting, and just ha just having finished re finished reading it, um, the visual images in my head. I mean, I I felt like I've just watched a movie rather than read a book. Uh, it's that vivid and that clear in terms of all the all the various characters uh, that constellate around uh, around Strang. Uh, so tell me, um, what was Okay, so you, you you kind of got interested in him in the beginning. By the time the the book went to press and all that, had, do you have a, a different sense of who he was than when you began? Well, I think long before the book went to press, um, I mean, I feel like this is going to be the hardest audience I ever do because people up there know the Strang story, um, mm -hmm. and they and and people up there also know that there have been some good books on Strang, at least mm -hmm. three of them by my count that I really like. Um, and um, what I brought that was different is um, I, I built on those books, Roger Van Nord and Vicki Cleverly Speak and Milo Quaif. They all did great books on Strang. But those books tended to look at Strang through the lens of either a kind of footnote to Mormon history or kind of a Michigan story. One of the books is called Assassination of a Michigan King. And I, from the start, saw Strang as 
a national story, a, a story about America at a pivotal time in its history. And I saw Strang as the lightning rod for all the many uh, religious enthusiasms of the, 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 what they call the antebellum period, the decades leading, leading up to the Civil War. So there were these incredible religious movements. There were uh, technological revolutions, the train, the uh, telegraph, uh, the photograph, which just changed the nature of space and time. Uh, there was a communications boom that was a lot really similar to our information superhighway. There was a big, uh, economic disaster called the Panic of 1837, um, and just incredible political movements. And I just saw Strang as kind of a lightning rod for all these different movements. And I really wanted to see him as more in the big picture. I was much more interested in how he fit into the American story than how he fit into the Mormon story or the Michigan story. Yeah, I, I have to say that I feel that uh, not only did I learn more about Strang, uh, but, you know, somebody who's done a lot of, uh, who's read a lot of Melville and uh, done, you know, and studied the Civil War, I guess I didn't know that much about the antebellum period. And I think that the way that you, that it reflects off this character, I found extraordinarily um, satisfying in terms of what led up to the Civil War and what, what uh, influences were involved. Uh, in, in order to actually create the tinderbox that exploded in the 1860s. Um, well, okay, so that so you're, you, you, this publisher suggests that you write about him. What was the research process like? Where, where'd you go? What'd you do? So there's some great um, repositories of Strang's archives, the best one being at Yale University in the famous Beinecke Library. And mm. uh, so I went there. I went. Uh, I went to... To Yale and, and did some research. There's also a great Strang collection closer to home for all of us is at Central Michigan University and I went there. Uh -huh. um, but I also benefited from a kind of technological revolution that um, previous researchers just didn't have access to in the past. I don't know, Peter, maybe 10 or 15 years, maybe five or 10 years, there's just been an amazing push to digitize old newspapers. So I had access to um, information from all over the country that um, some previous researchers just couldn't have had access to. And it, it led to some new discoveries about strength. Oh, that's, that's marvelous. God bless our librarians who digitize and organize and give us access to, to, to information. Yeah, there certainly has been an explosion since uh, the, the computer and since um, Wi-Fi and all that has has happened. That, that that's great. Um, did you did you come to the island as well for research? Oh, I did. Yeah, um, I I came. I guess it was four years ago this summer. Um, and I I would love to talk to you, Peter, and um, people um, listening in or and tuning into this about their impressions of the island. I mean, I found the island um, both. Um, in just stunningly beautiful place. Um, mm. I, I might even read a stretch, section where Strang sees the island for the first time. Oh, I, I'd, I'd, love, I'd love to know your impressions, Peter. I, I, but but I, I also, it was tricky because as you know, there's not a ton of old buildings. I mean, mostly Strang's left in place names. He had such a profound impact on the island in terms of place names, starting with St. James, King's Highway, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But, but um, Unlike his first colony in Burlington, Wisconsin, there's not a lot of old buildings left. And But despite all that, I just loved the beauty of the place. And partly because, as everyone who's tuning in knows, the island is still, I don't, you know, somewhat, you know, there's just a lot of dirt roads and a lot, just it's such a beautiful place. And it, you could feel how it must have felt um, to be, um, to be someone living there and just living so far from the um, the rest of the country in a way. Because, I mean, when you think about this, Peter, like our area was not called the Midwest back then. This was the West. This was mm. the far edges of the frontier. And so Beaver Island was a really isolated place um, in a lot of ways. It, it, it's isolated, but I mean, my own experience for coming to the island, me and, uh, and Frank Alotti, my partner, uh, was that, you know, arriving here on, on the ferry in 
pulling up to the ferry boat. I mean, we all got a collective case of the shivers as if certain energies were vibrating or intersecting on this island. And I know the Native Americans, um, they felt that it was a very spiritual place as well. I mean, beautiful for sure, isolated definitely and uh, undeveloped in, in all kinds of wonderful ways, but also just some, some place that's kind of magical. And so I can understand um, James Strang's uh, you know, attraction to the place, the idea that here I will build my kingdom and all that. It makes, per it, it makes perfect, perfect sense. Uh, I mean, every time I come to the island and I've been coming here for you know, 30 some odd years, I mean, there's something about arriving here that is both energizing and calming at the same time. So uh, uh, I'm, I, I love this place enormously. Enormous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I just, you know, I have this really choppy video, which I was so frustrated with myself with that when, when the ferry pulled into the island for about, I don't know, five or 10 minutes, just pulling into um, the harbor there, that I was just struck at how, what a beautiful place it is, and how kind of just um, powerful it is, right? It's out of the lake. We're not used to islands in Lake Michigan. I mean, I, obviously, there's an archipelago up there. But, you know, I don't think a lot of us who feel we know the lake, at least those of us on the south end of the lake, I'm a Chicagoan, mm -hmm. think of the lake as a place of islands. And so I found it haunting and mysterious. But I also thought, like, Strang was smart, you know. The, the, <laughs> there's a great harbor here, um, natural deep harbor. I mean, this stuff I'm, I'm, I'm not telling anyone in this audience, stuff uh, that, that they don't already know. Um, but you know, I think Strang also um, had other things in, in mind with the island. Um, he, he, uh, he saw it as a, a way of, um, uh, so, so in his first utopian colony, um, he'd attracted a lot of people, hundreds of people. Um, many of them soon, to, soon turned sour on him. He had um, been an atheist for most of his life. Uh, as as a lot of you know, and he um, went to uh, a Nauvoo, which was in the big Mormon capital on uh, the Mississippi River, in 1844, shortly before the murder of Joseph Smith, the founder and prophet of Mormonism. And he somehow converted from being a lifetime atheist to being a, a, what he claimed was a true believer, and then he suddenly had a letter in his possession, which he claimed um, gave uh, the church over to him from Smith, and he produced some other evidence. Um, and he drew a good following. He was, he's a brilliant speaker and really great manipulator of media. We could talk about that. But uh, the problem in Burlington was that people would come and they'd sour on him quickly, and then they'd stick around town. And other people would leave town that he wanted to stay. And so he realized he, he had to um, get out of there. And Beaver Island was just uh, perfect in a lot of different ways. The, the whole islands have in our imagination is just a really powerful one. There's a reason in the original book, Utopia, by Thomas More, he sets that on an island. Islands, my first book was about maps and old maps. It's called The Island of Lost Maps. And islands in the Renaissance and medieval period are these crazy things where we project our greatest hopes and fears. You know, they're, they're full of monsters and, and, and whatnot. But Strang um, also had, I think, a cynical reason for going to the island. He, um, he could keep his people there. He could control things much better. But he also set up a pirate colony on the island. And I think one of the things my book really um, pushes forward is the um, the idea that he was running a criminal enterprise out of the island. As, as, as many of your listeners or watchers know, um, there's been some argument about this. Some people think that, you know, there was the, 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 the multiple reports of uh, Mormon raids on coastal towns and, and other crimes were the result of anti-Mormon prejudices. And there were certainly many anti-Mormon prejudices, but I, um, was able to pin down some real sort of real time examples, one in particular of Mormon criminal activity. Uh, and so I, I think whatever false accusations were made against Strang, some of the accusations, many of the accusations were absolutely real.
Yeah, it does seem to me that, um, that there certainly is a long history of um, criminal acts in the name of God uh, <laughs> throughout history um, that it j justifies what they need to do in order you know, to survive, I suppose. But th that, that is true. Now, so you call this novel The King of Confidence. And of course, we have, you know, over the time, we've shortened that to Khan. Um, what, it, what is a confidence man? So confidence was um, uh, something that you needed in the 1840s and 50s. So this is a time of massive social change where um, basic truths aren't accepted by everyone. So the truth is porous, it's malleable. Someone like Strang can come around and twist the truth. And it's times like this that people like Strang really um, can thrive. Um, this is the period where we get the word confidence man because um, uh, we, we know that because in 1849, this guy's arrested in New York um, and he's called a confidence man in one of the New York newspapers and the word just spreads across the country. It's also the period of P.T. Barnum, the great uh, hoaxer, right? Like he, and, and he's one of the most famous men in, in American history until that time. And just would pull these kind of ornate practical jokes on the rest of the country. He had a museum in New York that he'd say, I've now found a mermaid and the mermaid's on display and people would get into the American Museum as they, as they call it and they'd see this monkey stitched to the bottom of a fish and they'd say, that's a monkey stitched to a fish. And he, he'd say, well, it could be, it could be. Why don't you come to my mu museum and see and decide for yourself? And so this is a period where the, the, the truth is very malleable. And I think in a lot of ways, it's like our time period in that. Yeah, that, that's the other thing that I think is remarkable in terms of your um, rhetorical strategy. You, you never actually overtly compare any moment there to the, the present uh, current uh, political and cultural situation, but the resonances are clear and loud in terms of the con man, um, the uh, multiplicity of truth, um, uh, that, that fact is, is malleable. Um, and that it, it, it takes enormous, you know, um, personalities of people who not only are begging for your confidence and your money, but who have an overweening confidence in themselves, uh, that for some reason beyond, uh, beyond reason, uh, attract people and make them follow them. Um, so I thought, I thought that was, you know, well, well played. The, ha the hand was kept, you know, close, but we could see your cards <laughs> because you kept them close. Well, it's interesting, you know, um, my um, work in this book totally coincided with President Trump's campaign and election and uh, presidency. And, um, you know, I, um, I don't think I would have written the same book if I would have been writing in a different time. I think mm -hmm. our times are so similar to, in certain ways, and of course in certain ways they're not, to um, this period of time that I always felt like that James J. Strang helped me understand Donald J. Trump and Donald J. Trump conversely helped me understand James J. Strang. Um, and so, I, but I didn't want to put any of that in the book. You know, the book's about Strang mm -hmm. and it's not about 2020. Um, but I make two sort of oblique references, one at the beginning of the book and one in the last line of the book um, about the future. But mostly I just think, you know, I'm a college professor in English and in the humanities, which I a firm believer in, as, as I know you are, Peter, we, yeah. we believe that um, the past helps us understand the present and future. And so I didn't mention our current times in this book, although, I think they are, they are sort of the, the historian Barbara Tuckman talked about the distant mirror mm. that the past I, sometimes I can give you to your own culture. And I think that this book, I've been really interested from day one when um, readers and critics started reading it, they said, well, this is sort of a parable for our own times, which, which was something I'd, I had hoped for, but not in any direct way. I'm not trying to make any comments on the president or, but I, but I do think it, it it helped me to understand my own times, and I hope it helps. It helps readers because I think that this, whatever whatever your politics are, we, we we I think we clearly live in a time of malleable truths. 
Yeah. And also I found in the, in the middle of the, well, maybe a hundred and something pages into it, uh, the, the intersection of not only the time, the antebellum time of the confidence man and all that, but of the abolitionist group and anti-slavery group group and the way that our present cult, um, political situation and the Black Lives Matter have intersected and the pandemic all, all together, it, it, it felt like, oh my gosh, history is repeating itself in a kind of way. Um, and uh, you do quote Thoreau, and I thought that was really kind of wonderful and, and moving and reassuring in a kind of way for those of us who are... Um, supporters of, of the Black Lives Matter group to say that, you know, it's one thing to be against slavery, it's another thing to do something about it. Yeah, uh, we, yeah and, and I think in a, in a similar way, um, the abolitionists were a huge thorn in everyone's side. Uh, they were righteous, and I mean that in the, they were righteous and self-righteous, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. They were sometimes very difficult to be around. Um, but they were ultimately right about slavery. And, uh, you know, sometimes I think that that's, that's, I try to, I try to, when I get irritated by somebody on TV now and say, well, that person's too strident. I just try to stop as a middle-aged person and say, but are they right? Mm. <laughs> and more often than not, way more often than not, I find myself saying, yes, they are right. That is a problem in our culture that needs to be addressed. But I think one thing for your, for your, for the, the people on Beaver Island that'll be of interest to this. And I think it's one thing I really added to the book. We knew, to, to, to other books, we knew Strang was an abolitionist and a supporter of African-American rights. And he ordained uh, elders into the church, an elder into the, a black elder into the church way more than a hundred years before the mainstream church did. So we, we knew about all that. But I think what I've added is um, an understanding of where this, I always say like the one thing I know that Strang believed in was kind of abolitionism was it, he was, he would deceive and waffle on almost every issue you can imagine, including polygamy. He was the anti-polygamy Mormon and then he died with five wives, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He's a very slippery character, mm -hmm. but abolition, he, 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 when he was in the Michigan legislature, later, he voted against his best interests for the rights of African Americans, and he did so consistently. And I pinned back a situation um, in his youth when he was a young lawyer, and he had a very corrupt um, father-in-law who was a canal contractor, which was then big business, and this and it was a great way to scam the government. And this guy was a, a scammer, and and again, he's a new a new figure in in the Strang story from this book, and he had. Um, he had worked on the Erie Canal and, and run out and taken the money. And he, then he worked in Virginia as a canal contractor and took the money and rang. And, and he sort of sent Strang out from uh, Western New York, where Strang lived, to clean up the mess. I think he was afraid. He'd been put in jail uh, in New York. And I think he, he's afraid that the same thing was going to happen to him in Virginia. And Strang got out there and, and wrote his father-in-law letter that said, you know, this is appalling the way you've treated people. Absolutely appalling. And uh, because the laborers there were slave laborers. It was African Americans who had no choice but to work on the canal. And Strang as a young man was just stunned by the horrific, horrendous conditions. And I, I, my, my feeling is that that image struck w stuck with him. You know, a lot of abolitionists had never really seen slavery firsthand, but he had, and he, hmm. he, was, he was in real time horrified by it. Yeah, I mean, I think that, again, holding up the, the crystal of this personality, I, I have to say that, the, you know, my early readings about him just, you know, I, I kind of dismissed him as a scoundrel, a very uh, charismatic one and all that. But to discover uh, other aspects of, of of him, and you know, particularly his gift for gab, his 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 language, his he, that he was a great, a really good lawyer, even if he wasn't a uh, a legal, legal one and a legislator. Uh, that everybody was so impressed by his gift of oratory uh, and 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 persuasion that there was a real brain going on inside of there. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, one of the, the fascinating things about this guy, you know, as a writer, you want to work with whether you're writing fiction or theater or film or, or nonfiction, you want to create or work with a 
or bring to life a three-dimensional character. And one thing about Strang was he, he was just incredibly three-dimensional, contradictory in the most fascinating ways. I mean, as, as many people on Beaver Island may or may not know, he was a great naturalist. I mean, he, he got a piece on the fisheries around Beaver Island published in the Smithsonian Annual Magazine against uh, uh, alongside all these famous scientists from the 19th century. It was stunning. He worked on a cloud sourcing uh, project that helped us understand how the weather works in the United States. And he played a small but not insignificant role in that. And so he was just an incredible person. Lori, I th I, do we have any questions that we should? I, I don't want to run w too far over time here. Hello, Lori, are you there? I'm don't see her picture, I just see a map of... Yeah, the... I'm here. Okay. Actually, we do have a question in the chat. It's from Kyle, and he says, um, you mentioned your interaction with the remnant of Strang's followers in Wisconsin. How did that experience affect your writing this story? Well, that's an interesting question. I... I, I um... I don't know if it affected the way I wrote the story, <laughs> partly because <laughs> when I when I met this this man, he's an elder in the Strangite Church. It's a very small church, and and he's a very interesting guy. But um, no one bothered to tell me <laughs> who he was, so I I showed up at the County Historical Society down in Burlington um, to do some research. And so and uh, I have a, a, a as I said, I have a friend who lives over there, and his mother had said, "Oh, there's someone I need you to meet." And, and I'll just send him over to the historical society. So <laughs> he sat down and we're talking and he's giving me advice on what I need to research and what I, and I'm, and I'm thinking, wow, this guy, and I, and I knew he was, he was, I guess I kind of knew he was in the church and he's a writer himself. And he mentioned his book and I, and I'd heard of his book and it was, I mean, it was a very interesting conversation. And then someone afterwards said, do you know who that guy is? And I said, well, I kind of, <laughs> uh, but it, so I don't think it really impacted me. Um, but I, you know, I, I'm, I'll, I'll be interested in hearing what the the, the remaining Strangites um, think of this book. I mean, I think in in one way it it shows him as a as a person who really believed in, for instance, abolitionism. It shows him in a more positive light. But in many ways, I think it also shows him in a more negative light. Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, which which is not. I, 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 to question anyone's faith, but it, I, it, I will be interested in their thoughts on that and the research. Yeah. So, any other questions? To submit a question, down in the middle of your screen at the bottom, there is a chat icon. Just click on it and um, pop your question in there. So, here we have another uh, question from you from Janelle Kieser. Hi, Miles. In your research, did you uncover any clarification regarding Strang's involvement in the disappearance of the Grand Traverse Lighthouse Keeper and his wife? You know, I, I've been asked that question, and, and I, I, I don't know the answer to it. It wasn't something I, I pursued, but that's the second time I've been asked that question, so maybe I should do some more research on that. So, um, but I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry to disappoint on that one. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Uh, the next question comes from uh, Rich Gillespie, and he says, my friend in St. Louis, John Habitjack, <laughs> believes that Strang was the chosen one, in uh, parentheses, successor. What are your findings on this? Um, so if, if, if his friend is a person I'm thinking of, he's a, he's a really great archivist of Strang. Um, that that name sounds like a man who did some really important research. Um, and um, uh, my feeling is that I don't question anyone's faith. I'm a person of faith myself. Um, <laughs> Strange revelations are between him and God. You know, one of the things he had on Brigham Young um, originally was that he claimed to be a prophet and Young, Young, backed off of that a little bit at first and, and said, well, you know, I, I, I'm not Joseph Smith. I'm not a prophet. And Strang said, well, I am. I am a prophet. Um, and so um, I think that drew people to him. Uh, I think he was, a, a, he made a really convincing case. I will say that in my 
I, I can't help it but uh, observe that many of his revelations benefited him and came at times where he would had his back up against the wall a little bit. But again, I would never question anyone else's uh, a faith about whether he was the, the right person or not. Um, I'm more interested in him as a, as a three-dimensional uh, figure. Okay, our next question comes from another fellow author of Strang History, uh, Vicki Speak. Oh, and she's great. Can I just plug her book? Wait, <laughs> I'm honored to have her on the show, even if she doesn't like my book. <laughs> Here's her book. And um, I've, never, I've never spoken with uh, Ms. Speak, but she's, her book is absolutely wonderful and really dives deep into the women in Strang's life. Her question is, I'm looking forward to hear more about the piracy issues. How does the piracy oh, compare to- Yeah, so, so the, um, the, the, one of the big finds I made was, um, so in uh, 1853 in Perrysburg, Ohio, um, there's um, real time reporting on, on first a horse thief comes to town and as Vicki knows and as, as many people here will know, horse theft was a big deal in the mid 19th century. There's a posse sent out after him. He's arrested. Uh, it, Vicky, it's Jonathan Pierce, one of Strang's top aides, kind of an enforcer. Um, he's put in jail. Strang comes to town in real time. This isn't reported about afterwards. Sometimes people said, oh, you know, these are reports afterwards that there's no evidence of. He's, he's, uh, Strang comes to town. The local paper and, an, and actually another paper predict that Strang is there for no good. Uh, there's a trial. Pierce is found guilty. This is also in real time. There's uh, a technicality that overturns the, con the, the conviction based on a, 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 a bureaucratic mess up that the sheriff made. And in real time, people are saying there's, you know, strongly hinting there's a bribe or some strong arming going on. So Pierce doesn't get sent to the state penitentiary. Then in real time, there's a jailbreak. And as Vicki knows, um, one of Strang's associates later accused him of, of directing a jailbreak in Perrysburg. So uh, this is one of a couple of cases, and I, I'd love to talk to you about it, Vicki, but, but, I, but I think it, it just comes closer than anything I've read to, to placing Strang you know, literally at the scene of a crime. And um, um, I, I think it's pretty solid stuff. Our next question comes from Dickie McAvoy, and he would like to know um, how many of his followers followers are still around, in your opinion? Oh, it's it's not my opinion, and I'm not an expert on the string I bring of the brand, uh, 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 branch of the church. But I think the website says, and and there are clearly people in the audience who could correct me on this, so feel free to chime in. I think it's a hundred and some people. Um, uh, and, and they're all in Burlington, Wisconsin? Is no, it? I don't think so. Uh, John is in St. Louis, for instance, I think. And uh, I, I mean, I, I really honestly, I'm, I'm so I should say, Peter, you know, that I'm, um, I, it wasn't that I was uninterested in, in Strang's place in church history or his place in Michigan history, but I was much more interested, for instance, in where um, Strang fit in with Herman Melville, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Edgar Allan Poe than I was where uh, where he fit in with with various other Mormon leaders. Um, that was just my interest. There's been some great writing about um, the other subject. Okay, our next question comes from Penny Strong. What did you find out about his being a king and the entire coronation process, which seems contrary to Mormonism? Well, I, again, I'm not a theologian, so I can't say if it's if it's contrary to Mormonism. It, it was um, so the interesting thing about Strang, he comes from this time. This is the period that we talk about the self-made man, right? Strang's diaries from a really like they're, they're, we have access to his diaries from late teens to early 20s. And he talks about how he wants to be a king, right? He he there's a great passage where he writes about then Princess Victoria, and he says, you know, if only, and he's a, he's a, you know, farm boy from Western New York at that point. I can't remember if he had his law degree or not, probably not. But anyway, well, it wouldn't have been a degree anyway. He would have been a, a practicing lawyer. He was kind of a country lawyer. Um, he, um, 
he says, oh, if only I had the chance, if only I could get over there and meet her, I'd marry Victoria and I'd be king of England. You know, so he, he was a self-actualizer to an amazing degree. And this was a period of amazing self-actualization, you know, this is a self-made man. And one of, one of the people I love thinking about with Strang is, is Lincoln, because, you know, they have so much in common, these two guys. You know, they're both country boys who become country lawyers. They both become postmasters general, which was, you know, very... Uh, interesting and important job. They both become state representatives. They both have a, a build a following. And, um, you know, I, I mean, Strang um, went one way and Lincoln went the other. <laughs> but Strang was more famous than Lincoln for much of their, their shared careers, you know. And so I, I think Strang is whatever else you think about it. And I think he's just, uh, I call him an American original. I, I think he's just a, a, a touchstone figure. I'm not saying, you know, that he's as important as Lincoln. He's not. But he, to me, he's just a, a kind of person that America produces. And whether you think he is a prophet, a, the true prophet, whether you think he's a scam artist, I think he's an important person to study because I think he says a lot about this crucial time period in American history. Our next question comes from Emily Aquist. What would you say was his most noteworthy accomplishment as a legislator? So um, I'm very interested in his um, work against the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Um, so um, this act, um, people may remember, was uh, it was one of the things that really set the Civil War in motion. And it was a compromise passed in Congress that um, allowed Southerners to come up and grab slaves who were on the loose. And um, to combat it, there was uh, a, a something called personal liberty laws, where the Northern states tried to nullify or undercut this federal law by saying, so in Strang's case, I think they said, uh, they passed a law in the Michigan House that said, oh, um, you can come up to Michigan and grab your slaves, but you can't use our jails and you can't use, you can't, I think you can't use our you know, constables, and you got to do it on your own, which meant basically, you know, if you came up to, let's say, Petoskey and uh, grabbed a free slave, uh, you would have a long uh, walk with him home without any help or any sleep, right? Mm -hmm. So, and at the time, the South went nuts. So for those of you uh, who think that the South, the Civil War is fought over this issue of states' rights, please study the personal liberty laws. The response from the South was not, well, those states sure have a right to their own uh, laws. After all, we believe in states' rights. It was, there is a federal law, the Fugitive Slave Act, and these states have no rights to protect these slaves. And um, but Strang was, he, he worked for that, he voted for that, he worked hard on uh, issues of African American rights and against his own interests in a lot of ways. He was working with the brand new Republican Party, which as many people know, kind of got its start in Michigan. There's some debate about that, but we know that it, one of its big, uh, and, and uh, um, the big part of the movement was in Michigan and it swept into power. And um, so Strang was a Democrat, um, but he voted with these Republicans who, who didn't pay him back with much kindness, it must be said. But, um, but uh, he, it's the one time I know that Strang worked against his own political interests. And so that's why I kind of, I kind of think of him as, as more of a protector of African American rights and, and, and working against slavery than, than I think he's, he's kind of given credit for. I, I just, I, it seemed to me that this is the one thing he held true that was his rock bottom. There's some asterisks on that, but, uh, which I'm glad to talk about. But, um, but uh, yeah, that's, so that was the thing I thought was really interesting about him in the legislature. And I'm sure there's many other things we could talk about, but that really struck out to me. Okay, we have another question from Penny Strong. So since Strang was considered himself a king, she asked, did he have one queen or more than one? Well, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, I, actually, that's a good question. I don't think they, they crowned a queen. He had a viceroy, uh, a man by the name uh, of George J. Adams for a while, who, so essentially a prime minister, but they, um, and this is one of the great cads and incredible figures um, of the mid 19th century. Um, 
uh, and but they had a falling out. This guy would uh, was a Shakespearean actor slash Mormon preacher who would go all over the country uh, reading Richard III one night and preaching the gospel of James Strang the next night. And um, he led a wild career that ended up um, with uh, his own utopian colony uh, in, in the Middle East that was disastrous. Um, Mark Twain met survivors of this colony and wrote about them in Innocence Abroad. And uh, one scholar who I think makes a great case thinks that this guy, George J. Adams Strang's prime minister, was the uh, model for the king, uh, the con man in Huckleberry uh, Finn. So, um, uh, Strang surrounded himself with some amazing figures. Okay, here's a comment from Vicki Speak again. She says that she's impressed you were able to find information. Nice job. I mean, new information. I didn't like the review of your book in the New York Times, but I'm looking forward to reading your book. That's all I ask, Vicki. Thank you for that. And um, I, I have primo uh, respect for you and what you do. And I have talked up your book, I think, at three events now. So, uh, and I, I, that, which is not to say you should like my book. It is to say that I like your book and that, that I respect your work. Um, and we can have di differences uh, about Strang's stature, his intent. Um, but I, I, I hope you'll respect some of the research I did. And she comes back and says, I'm laughing here because you and I both have been taken in by this confidence man. <laughs> <laughs> he has completely seduced me. And I got to say, like, uh, Vicki, I don't know how you feel, but I, um, one of Let the sad parts about putting out this book is that I'm not around him all the time. I mean, I feel like when, you know, we all have those few weeks with our books and when I'm not, I, he's, I really will miss him. I, I say that in the book. I mean, he was a total joy to write about and I found him to be, like I say, I found him to be such a com truly complex human being in the most interesting of ways. And so, um, yeah, I could, I could argue with people who don't think he was, um, Operating a criminal enterprise, I, I think he was, and I, I, I and I. But 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 again, with that, there was a lot of anti-Mormon prejudice, and, and definitely in the Midwest, and definitely near Beaver Island, there was plenty of it. Um, and and so, um, but I am just so grateful to have had the opportunity to research this completely fascinating man. Hi, Vicky, I see you on. Hi. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I, I it's a pleasure to meet you. And you too. Thanks. I'm really impressed with what you were able to find out about William Pierce, because uh, I was able to the was first one to find out about the canal work, but right. you took I, it from that, and I, I'm really I, impressed. You will see a lot of things where I stood on your shoulders, uh, metaphorically, Vicky. Uh, yes, Vicky had put in her book in previous books. Strang's father-in-law had been identified as a candle maker, right, Vicky? Correct. Uh -huh. and, and and Strang said, uh, or uh, Strang, <laughs> Vicky said, no, that <laughs> that's a bad um, a bad reading of of that cramped handwriting. He was a canal contractor, which, <laughs> when I read Vicky's passage on that, many many light bulbs went off, and I just started digging into his work as a canal contractor and. Um, he's one of the, the guys I really had fun uncovering because he, he, the father-in-law was such a scoundrel. And, you know, Vicki, uh, say what you want. I mean, it's, Strang had a way of surrounding himself with scoundrels from an early, yes, an early time, whether it was just, whether it was just um, uh, unfortunate circumstances or, or a kinship. Uh, we can leave that open to debate. But um, this was another scoundrel. And I thought what was interesting for me about it is that uh, – I could see Strang being being drawn to a man like Pierce, um, who kind of, again, made his own way in the world as people were able to do in the antebellum period. You know, he was, I, he, he's caught uh, taking the money and run on the Erie Canal, <laughs> put in jail. He's kind of, I mean, there's legislative hearings about him. And then the next thing you know, he's doing a contract in Virginia where he does the same thing. And then he gets hired to work on the Illinois and Michigan Canal. And then the last, uh, the last mo mention I have of him in the book is um, Abraham Lincoln is defending him uh, as a lawyer, uh, Strang's father-in-law, 
against charges of the same thing working on the railroads later on. So he, he was a, a real character. And I, I just think that one of the exciting and uh, weird things about that time was you could, you, could, um, you could kind of move west and recreate yourself. A, a quick question from, from here. Did, did, do we know if, did Strang meet Mary through her father or the other way around? That's a good, uh, Vicky, I, th well, they, uh, that's a good question. Uh, do you remember Vicky? Um, no, I don't. I'm supposed to be the one on the spot here, not Vicky, whose books. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't, I think he, I think he may have known no, Mary, no. Mary socially. He knew right? her, he knew her uncle. Oh, that's uh, right. Benjamin. Oh, oh of course Benjamin he did. Pierce. Ben Benjamin Pierce was one of his best friends and was one of the, well, yeah, of course he did. They were they were school chums and very close friends. And um, uh, the, uh, a lot of people say that uh, Benjamin Pierce was Mary's uncle, but he was not, or um, her, her brother, brother. But he was actually her brother, her uncle. Right, and they but there was a difference in age, and he was Strang's good buddy, and he was uh, the the member of a a Mormon, a small Mormon community in in Burlington, Wisconsin, that had gotten. Some guys from New York had come in and settled in Burlington even before uh, there were sort of uh, it was there was it was a territory. They sort of uh, set up squatters' rights there, and Strang came out and, and stayed with him. Uh, this guy Benjamin Pierce is is sometimes accused by um, associates and by secondary sources of being a collaborator of Strang's and stay, setting up some of the alleged hoaxes that he committed. Uh, in Burlington or didn't. Again, um, he found these brass plates in a hill top, uh, much like Joseph Smith did. And that, that, that more than the letter started to convince people. And um, uh, later, um, someone who knew one of the guys Strang was hanging out with said that was a, a, all a, a fraud. And I, I think in some of this stuff, we just, ju just don't know. But, uh, but but Pearson Strang had uh, Pearson Strang had some kind of falling out, or, or Pierce went back east and and died in a in a terrible accident, and so they weren't close. At, at, at they were there was something that went wrong, I think, with that one. I mean, I don't I didn't find any evidence of what it was, but but Pierce left uh, Burlington and went back east and, and died. Um, uh, so uh, I'm not sure what that was, but yeah. Okay, we have a couple other questions now. Um, the next one comes from Kyle, and he's asked a couple of questions already. So I'm going to unmute his microphone and let him ask the next one. Hi, Kyle. Hi, Miles. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. It's such a treat. Um, I just got into your book. I'm only on page uh, 19, so. <laughs> um, but I'm I'm actually doing a PhD dissertation on Wingfield Watts, and who you may uh, know such supplied a lot of the documents to uh, yeah. Milo Clay. Um, so, uh, one of the big things that you're trying to communicate to the reader is the importance of the cultural context that James Strang, you know, lived and moved and had his being in. And so I wonder, do you think uh, Strang could have accomplished the things that he did had he not lived in antebellum mid-19th century America in this age of confidence? Uh, Vicki, again, feel free to jump in. My own feeling is he was both, he was a product of his time. Um, I, I think this is a period where there are all sorts of exciting things starting up. Kyle, as you know, they sometimes called the Erie Canal. You know, Strang was born in Western New York, and he lived in what's called the Burned Over District because there were so many fevers burning through there. Religious fevers, including Mormonism, was such an exciting new religion. Um, but many, many different religious fevers. But this is also, you know, where the, the uh, hub for the abolition movement is, where the women's movement gets started. But it's, but it's also just uh, a fertile ground for all sorts of craziness, apocalyptic movements, spiritual rappers, um, uh, everything. And they called the, the Erie Canal the psychic highway. I saw, I've seen a historian identify as that, and I, and I really like that. And so Strang grew up in this in extraordinarily crazy and fertile and productive and weird place. And so, um, and, and meanwhile, he's like, he's like such an interesting figure because he's, he's an atheist. So he gets these new ideas. I mean, atheism is an old idea, but, but, but uh, you know, he, he's kind of 
secretly writing, I'm an atheist. And he, he later told a newspaper reporter until he got to Nauvoo and converted to Mormonism, he was an atheist. Um, but he's also steeped in this Baptist upbringing and, and mm. sees these fires around him, talks about, you know, these religious revivals and how he went to it and it was all crazy and wrong. But then he says, you know, um, basically he says in one entry, uh, you know, uh, I'm an atheist, but when I talk religion, people really like it and they're really moved by me. And so I just see him as both, you know, a very much a product of his times in the answer to your question, Kyle, but also both someone, I think he's, he's really has an impulse towards idealism that comes out of this period. Mm. But I think he's also has this, um, he knows how to use people. And, and he, he says that and he's, he, he can, he's quite, so I think there's these opportunist and idealist are always at, at war with him, I think. Mm. Thank you, thank you. Vicky, did you want to add to that? You may have a completely different perspective. Uh, no, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I think that he's, he was uh, taking the opportunity to become a prophet and then became, then started uh, believing his own story. It's, it, from what I've been reading, it seems like zeal is in the air. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's current, it's fashionable. Um, so, I mean, to jump on that cultural moment seems to me gave him an opportunity to do what he did that maybe other eras in American history would not have given. Yeah, Kyle, there, there's a, and thanks for that, Peter, because I think that's true. There's, a, there's a, a piece in the New Yorker that I'm reading now about um, the bubonic plague of the 14th century and how it created this, this like, how many good new things came out of it because people realized they had to work collectively. And I think Strang is, is, is coming on, he's in a similar period where people are just, I mean, it is hard for us to imagine how unstable things were in this period. Um, and, and so Strang is, is someone who, and I, I agree with you, Vicki, I think we have the same analysis in, in a big way. I mean, I, I think, I think Strang um, was, um, uh, someone who was capable of lying, but also somehow thought my lies are okay after a while because uh, I'm a chosen, I, I don't want to use the word chosen because they have re religious connotations because I, I'm a great leader. And I, um, I mean, and, and we see it even in some of the stuff like I, there's this, um, there's this piece in the Northern Islander. He was a great, uh, he, he constructed his whole life out of words I write in the book. And I, I think that's very true. But he was, he, I mean, as a writer, I really admire him. He's not like a flashy, you know, I wouldn't put down a Melville novel or a Dickens novel to read Strang. I'm glad he didn't write fiction. But he's a really solid journalist and a great uh, propagandist. And um, in the Northern Islander, there's something really interesting. I think it was in 1853. Um, there's a piece by a guy named Fred Douglas, who, um, and it says Fred. <laughs> this is... Frederick Douglass, um, the former slave and great abolitionist. Um, and it's, it, I, don't, I didn't find this work excerpted anywhere else at that time, which is not to say it wasn't, I just didn't find it. I looked in a bunch of databases and didn't find it. What's interesting is what um, Strang excerpted, which was uh, Douglass just had a, a, a new, uh, he, he, Douglass wrote a couple of, a few autobiographies and he had a new autobiography out. And so Strang excerpted from that, which was very much the idealistic side of him, right? Here's the, here's the abolitionist uh, excerpting Frederick Douglass, an African-American man in the Northern Islander newspaper. What he excerpts is um, Douglass talking about when it's okay for slaves to steal, right? Um, basically saying, when you're an oppressed people, when you have no other options, but you need to feed yourself, when you have a righteous cause, it's okay to steal. And so I just find that like the, the opportunistic strang and the idealistic strang side by side in that. I mean, I think he was an abolitionist and it's also to, um, to people who are already engaged in theft, that much is, must have sound like uh, a self-justification. Hey, we're just, we're doing, what, we're doing what's okay here. I think it was coded language to his own people or self-justification. But I found it, I, there, was, <laughs> there was a lot from that book he could have excerpted in the Northern Islander. And I think it's significant that he chose that. Our next question comes from um, Catherine Hartrick. 
and I've unmuted her and I'm going to allow her to ask it. Uh, hello. Hi, and, Catherine. Uh, and Thank uh, you. It's great to see you. I'm actually in Wilmette, but come up to Beaver Island every summer. So, uh, and I, I asked this question with the treat of you and Vicki both being uh, on this call, but, and kind of with his opportunistic, wasn't it that he was initially against polygamy? And then, uh, of course, and then his, wasn't it his second wife pretended to be a man and traveled with him to New York? And so just, I'd, I'd love to hear even from one or both of you about that. Vicki, do you want to start on that? It's one of the great subplots of the Strang saga. I love Elvira. I just <laughs> love Elvira. And I, I think that somebody ought to do a movie about her someday. Uh, yes, she was, uh, I think she was his soulmate. And she was the reason why he rejected, he went to, to polygamy because he fell in love for the first time. That's what I think. I think so too. And you don't quite say that in your book, Vicki, but I, I got that out of it. I, I think um, I want to talk about Vicki's work on the women of Beaver Island in a minute. But uh, so in 1849, Strang traveled the country with um, uh, a guy named Charles J. Douglas, who wasn't Charles J. Douglas, was this woman, Elvira Field, who was secretly Strang's first polygamous wife or first plural wife, which means he was already married to a woman by the name of Mary Purse Strang. Um, and there's, there's literally a photograph of this kind of dashing looking young man who's not a young man <laughs> in, in men's clothing. And um, uh, as Vicki makes abundantly clear in her book, they didn't fool everybody. But one of the, the, the amazing things is that they fooled a lot of people. And I think that has a lot to say about gender relations at this time, you know, um, uh, there was, I, I did a lot of writing sort of around um, some of the, the research that Vicki did where um, uh, I talked about how, um, uh, just how uh, divided, how sim the symbolism of women's clothing at this time, women would wear mm -hmm. pounds and pounds of corsets and other clothing, clothing that symbolize femininity. And it's, it's hard for us to say, um, um, oh, you know, you couldn't recognize uh, a woman in man's clothing, but there were, these signifiers were so profound. And it's the same, you know, we can talk about pantaloons on the island, but uh, Strang was asking women on the island, or women were wearing, including Elvira Field, were wearing uh, pantaloons, which uh, we might call bloomers. They, they kind of look like Turkish pants or pajama pants on the island, uh, more than, or not more than, Vicki Wright, a little bit less than a year before Amelia Bloomer, the famous proto-feminist women's rights activist was wearing them. Now we call them bloomers because they became so associated with the women's rights movement. But so in many ways, uh, Strang was progressive. But I, I just want to, again, put in an endorsement for Vicki's book. That That's great. She, what, Vicki, uh, Thank uh, you. Um, if you. If you don't mind me, um, Vicki moved the bar so much forward with the women of the island, which was so hard, and Strang's wives, which was so, they're such fascinating people, and I, I agree that Elvira is just an amazing person. <laughs> um, but it's also, like I know from the research myself, it's so hard to do. There's so little about Strang's domestic life, and I was quite dependent on and Vicky's research in my book, because and <laughs> endlessly grateful for Vicky's research, and I don't think I mean, I, I've, when I've talked about your work before, Vicki, I don't know how you would describe it. I mean, I, I, I see it as something of a feminist take on Strang. I, I don't know if you would use those words, um, and I don't want to put words yes, in your mouth. Yes, I think he was. I think he was a feminist, and he, uh, Charlie Douglas did some writing about women's rights. Uh, I think he totally was a feminist. And I, I don't know if you noticed, but did you realize that uh, Elvira's first child was born almost exactly nine months after the coronation. Excellent. Almost exactly nine months. Another bit, another bit of trivia, four of his five wives were pregnant when he was murdered by his own people in 1856. I know. Oh. Yeah, he, he, left behind, <laughs> he left behind a legacy. <laughs> yeah, so no, and, 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 and uh, this woman, Elvira, is so much, uh, interesting. You know, Margaret Fuller, one of the great, you know, who wrote this great um, 
really one of the really early important um, books on women's rights in the 1840s. And it's, it's a really good writer and it's a really interesting book. And, and she talks about gender fluidity in ways that would just be so, um, that young people would be so like, she literally calls it fluid. She says, none of us are completely male or female. But, but she talked about how um, if you don't accept these codes of femininity, these, the clothes, et cetera, et cetera, uh, sometimes it's called the cult of true womanhood in the, in the antebellum period, that you become kind of a, she used the word outlaw, like a gender outlaw. And I always, I always saw Avira as kind of an outlaw. She got to practice some um, things that, that only men would get to do in that culture. And, I, you know, um, I think it'll be interesting to talk to you sometime to see, I mean, I, I, I my own sense is that um, uh, she wasn't particularly happy when she, um, and not, not, I don't know if she was unhappy, but I don't, I think she liked being, uh, my hunch is she liked being Charles Douglas better than Elvira Field. Um, uh, there's a, someone who knew her talks about how um, she was always cheerful, but she seemed very sad inside after she started having children and had to lead kind of domestic life. Were you able to find any evidence of concubines? I wasn't, you know, I, again, Vicki, I, I owe you a lot for this. I mean, it wasn't the main focus of my book, but I, but I, I was glad to, to work on the, the, the domestic stuff. And, and, and you'll see, I, I, I mean, I built off your work is what I did. And I didn't, I didn't advance it real far. I just was grateful for it because I think it's important thank you. work. Well, thank you. I'm really excited to read it. And uh, hopefully I'll meet you around Chicago area. Yeah, thanks for buying thanks so it. Much. It would be great if we had like live book events at some, but this is, I'm so happy for this because how could I just like have Vicki show up? It's so great. No, thank you, Historical <laughs> Society too. Yes, thank you, Lori. You're welcome. Um, so the next person that would like to ask you a question is Cynthia and Cynthia Johnson, and she has already interviewed you once, but she is the editor of our Beaver Islander uh, newspaper. And Cynthia, are you there? Let's see. I don't really know if I have a really good working microphone. You can read that question for me, please. Okay, so Cynthia asks, and this is a cute one for you, how do you picture yourself if you existed back in these times knowing what you know, what character would you be like were you in the island of the lost maps? <laughs> I'm gonna let Vicky handle that one. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I, I think I, I, I'm an observer and I, I love bearing witness. I, I think um, I would have been a reporter trying to interview Strang, like, a, like I'm a, a researcher trying to figure out Strang. Um, I think I would have found him as interesting then. I hope, I hope I would have been, um, you know, the problem with prejudices is, is that we're, we're unaware of them, not that we're aware of them. Sometimes we're aware of them, but, but I hope I would have been uh, broad-minded enough to, be, to see him as the incredible, whatever else you thought about him, the incredible three-dimensional figure that he was. And I, and, I, and I hope I would have wanted to find out more. You know, he was always, you know, he was dismissed in a lot of, of press stories. Um, they called him his majesty and, and um, but the president of the United States took him seriously enough. Um, Millard Fillmore um, ordered the Navy's first iron hulled warship to invade the island and bring him back to justice. So the I idea of a quasi independent state in, in on American soil um, did not go down well in, in Washington. <laughs> so, um, but, but I hope I would have been open minded enough to, to come up to the island and just actually interview him. There's, there's some people at the time who, who did interesting interviews with him. So. How about you, Vicki? Oh, I, I love Elvira, but I really, really like Sarah. Sarah yep. Right Wing. What an interesting character. Yeah, and, and she accomplished so much after leaving Strang, unlike the other wives, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, That's leaving so Strang. <laughs> there wasn't much leaving. It was uh, after Strang left them. Uh, right. The next question comes from Kyle again. <laughs> Are you there? Oh, sorry. I thought that uh, it was it was more of a comment um, uh, when we were talking about uh, James Strang um, as a feminist or 
uh, at least um, his uh, wanting to see women being promoted within his own organization under, uh, unlike, you know, alternative forms of Mormonism at his day, uh, his one, you know, big piece of scripture, the book of the law of the Lord, allowed for the ordination of women to certain offices, uh, which required holding the priesthood. Mm -hmm. So that was a pretty radical uh, difference between Strang and, and his contemporaries. Another thing that's interesting about um, that book is um, Strang's, again, when we use the word feminism, I'm not sure that word was used in, in the, the mid 18th, 19th century. So it's probably proto-feminist or women's rights, um, which was definitely a, a word that was used. But another thing that's really interesting about that book is that there's this environmental consciousness um, that in one way is just practical and shrewd, and in another way reads like it's something out of, uh, 2020, um, uh, the, the Green New Deal, right? So Strang tells people on the island when they, and, and Vicki, correct me if I'm getting the details wrong, when they cut down a tree, they have to grow a tree because, partly because trees were, um, they were called green gold by some historians, you know, they, they were essential to Strang's making money because the steamboats would come by Beaver Island and use them, but also the great pine trees in Michigan were, were what settled the prairie, you know, in, in the prairie there were no, um, you know, there were no trees. And so they'd ship trees down from, from the North Woods. And, and, but, but Strang has a, a it, there's a clear environmental consciousness in that, a clear sense of, we only have this island and we need to preserve it. Um, that it, to me is really rare from that period. Well, I don't see any more questions in the chat. So um, real quickly, if I missed your question, Ping me right now and I'll uh, go back and look for it. Um, normally we would have, last week would have been our museum week, which is a, a week long um, event that we have on Beaver Island to celebrate the history of the island. And of course, Strang is part of our history. Um, and, you know, during this whole COVID, um, period. We didn't get to do a whole lot of events. So I'm very grateful that you're online with us tonight and um, it's, it's programming and uh, of great interest to people here. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Lori, for doing this. It was, you know, it, it's water in the desert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had a discussion with, with, with interesting, wonderful people. Yeah. Can, can I just can I just say my sincere thanks to everyone who tuned in tonight, but but to you, Peter, I was just so um, delighted to speak with you and Laurie. Thank you for arranging this. And and Vicky, what a, a honor and a delight to um, share the computer screen with you. <laughs> oh, thank you, and congratulations on your book. I can't wait thanks. to read it. Thanks. And we'll talk. Okay, great. Well, if. Uh, if that's all, everyone, thank you for coming and we can end our Zoom chat right now. We have a lot of thank yous and thank you everybody for coming. Thanks everyone. Um, Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Lori. Yeah, I have the book for sale in the museums if you haven't picked up a copy yet. Um, Please I'll buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be open on Wednesday. Wonderful. Thank all you. Right. Thank Bye. you. Good night, everyone. <laughs>